ICA welcomes you to this event and thanks you for your participation. To improve the quality of the video conference, please take note of the following recommendations. Remember to unmute your microphone only when you are given the floor. Please keep your microphone muted when another person is speaking. We ask that you keep your camera on at all times so that the other participants can see you. If you need to step away for a moment, you can turn the camera off and turn it back on when you return. Please put your cell phone in silent mode to avoid any interruptions during the video conference. We recommend that you maintain proper posture and position yourself adequately in front of your computer. Simultaneous interpretation will be provided for this meeting. It is very important that you speak in the language corresponding to the Zoom link you selected. For instance, if you accessed the link to the meeting in Spanish, you must speak in Spanish at all times. At the end of the video, please remain silent for 30 seconds. Afterwards, the moderator will begin the meeting. Thank you very much for your attention. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to this series on sustainable beef in the Americas. This is our third version, right? We have a series of five webinars. We have another one next week and at the beginning of June. Today, the focus will be more on the contributions of how livestock preserve high value food systems. And we're gonna include like land conversion. We're gonna talk about grasslands and a whole bunch of other topics. And as usual, you may recall, we start off with about two videos. We have one from IFAD, Ron Hartman in Rome. And we have another one. Our Deputy Director General Arica in Costa Rica could not be with us today. So he's provided a video. It'll give you some context, some opening remarks. And then we will follow with, to give you some context, we're gonna have a really interesting perspective from Colombia, from SEAT and Biodiversity in, uh, International, the Alliance for Biodiversity at SEAT is um, the Managing Director is Jesus Quintana. Really looking forward to his presentation. And so let's start with the two videos and we'll go from there. Thanks, Oriel. Hello, my name is Lloyd Day and I'm the Deputy Director General of the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation on Agriculture, ICA. ICA represents the ministers of agriculture of the Western Hemisphere from Canada in the north to Chile and Argentina in the south, and 14 member states in the Caribbean as well. Our mission is to promote agricultural development and rural well being in the Americas and the Caribbean, and to serve as a bridge for this region's contribution to agricultural production and science around the world. Welcome to this webinar series from ICA Canada on sustainable beef. As someone who once led the checkoff programs at the US Department of Agriculture, the saying, beef, it's what's for dinner, is embedded in my DNA. Working on behalf of agriculture in the Americas, I can tell you that I have not only enjoyed a good steak in Ottawa, our Canadian host city, but also in many other cities and countries in the Americas where the beef sector is not just an important part of each nation's economic activity, but is ingrained in the culture, society, and history of the people. However, the sector also faces many challenges with growing anxiety about climate change and certain methods of production, as well as animal welfare. We must address these concerns to improve not just our methods of production for the sake of the environment and animals, but also show how the sector is vital for its contributions to society. Therefore, we at IECA have been working closely with myriad organizations in the livestock sector to ensure a more balanced and scientific analysis of the importance of livestock. In preparation for the UN Food Systems Summit, ECA partnered with the livestock sector in multiple different fora and publications to provide guidance and leadership from the Americas on the contributions of livestock to the human health, nutrition, the economy, and the environment. This culminated with ECA's Director General, Dr. Manuel Otero, presenting 16 key messages from the Americas to the United Nations Food Systems Summit 
regarding agriculture's important role in the transformation of the world's food systems based on farmers, science, and agriculture as part of the solution to our planetary challenges. We are delighted to be joining in these webinars with the Global Roundtable for Sustainable Beef, with whom EECA formed an alliance in 2022 and the Canadian Roundtable on Sustainable Beef, our Canadian partner. Thank you to the International Fund for Agricultural Development, EFAD, for their sponsorship of these webinars and the decades of collaboration with the ECA in the Americas. We are very grateful also for the time and intellectual contribution by all of our speakers during these sessions. Your contributions to these discussions will become part of the intellectual record that will help us promote our goal to provide important contributions to the policies that nations generate to help support sustainable beef production in the Americas, the Caribbean, and other regions of the world. Thank you and best wishes for a successful webinar. On behalf of EFAD, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this seminar on sustainable livestock. This initiative, organized by the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation on Agriculture and financed by the International Fund for Agriculture Development, or EFAD, also has the technical support of the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Beef and the Global Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. As you know, climate change will affect animal health, well-being, and productivity with resulting effects, especially on pastoralists and small-scale livestock keepers. Changes in climate can lead to new animal pests or to the return of previously eradicated diseases. The secondary impacts of climate change on livestock may include, among others, increased pressure on productive pastures, water resources, and increased fodder prices, ultimately resulting in a loss of food sources, income, and livestock assets. Climate change impacts on poor and disadvantaged rural people disproportionately. Pastoralists, poor households, women, children, youth, and marginalized indigenous groups being particularly vulnerable. In addition, poverty, lack of political power, and marginalization from decision-making processes reduce the ability of these groups to adapt to climate change. Climate change is likely to intensify existing inequalities and have different effects on the capacity of women and men to cope with additional stress. In fact, women play a significant and active role in livestock production systems. Climate change necessitates rethinking approaches to gender inequality and to involve both women and men in finding innovative solutions. Between 2003 and 2015, EFAD invested almost 500 million US dollars to promote pastoral development. In addition, last year, EFAD launched the Adaptation for Smallholder Agriculture Program, or ASSET Plus, which aims at increasing the resilience of vulnerable communities, farmers, fishers, and pastoralists. For example, in Sudan, livestock business development aims to promote access to finance for livestock owners and market development of the national livestock industry. In Lesotho, wool and mohair production is being improved on the ground with co-benefits for rangeland rehabilitation. In Kyrgyzstan, Asset Plus contributes to enhancing economic growth in pastoral communities through community-driven development approaches. Thank you in advance for your participation today. We look forward to the outcomes of today's discussion. Thank you. Well, my thanks to both of you uh, for your opening remarks, uh, Ron and Lloyd. You, I'm uh, Dr. Jean-Charles Levalli, uh, the hosts for today's session. Uh, we're based here in, in Ottawa at ICA Canada. I'm the country representative. And you saw from Lloyd's uh, video, his opening remarks, that the chatting is really important. And, so what we don't really have a Q&A uh, at the end. I'm inviting all of you to provide chatting opportunities throughout the session. In Zoom, we have a chat function. I know we have many, many people. Actually, we even have more people in YouTube and Facebook watching us than in Zoom. So we have people, we have ECA colleagues monitoring the chats there. Feel free to 
uh, chat in your platforms and we'll, we'll bring over some of the questions to Zoom so that the panelists throughout the entire webinar can contribute and answer and, and talk to each other. Um, I want to have Dr. Quintana provide uh, some background, a context for today's topic. So I'd like to invite him from Colombia. Over to you, Jesus. Bueno, 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 buenas tardes. Well, good afternoon. Good morning for some. A special appreciation to ICA, Mr. Leveleva, having invited the Alliance to be present here. Thank you. I will be speaking in Spanish. I know there is simultaneous interpretation, so in benefit of all speakers, uh, I will share my presentation in English, but I will be speaking in Spanish. So allow me to share my screen. Just one moment. Well, I was asked to refer at this webinar to, to talk about options for uh, livestock in the Americas and how we can help uh, preserve high value food systems. I would just like to remind you, I know, I know this is uh, this is uh, very important. Livestock, uh, it is uh, no wonder that is a, a pillar to all global, uh, regional and local food systems. A bit of uh, comments uh, uh, regarding livestock and its contributions. Uh, it represents 40% of the global value of agricultural output. It is also important for food security and nutrition. It is a very important source of high quality protein. For example, in the region, these are, this is old data from uh, AFS, but almost 43% of human protein came from these uh, animal source uh, foods. And very important is poverty reduction because uh, livestock is related to income, to employment, to livelihoods, which is so important for 1.3 billion people in the world and has a very important cultural and social relevance. Half, half a, uh, a billion pastoralists of all different sizes. And that is the importance. We see the importance of livestock in landscapes and obviously uh, the food it produces and the potential it has for greater preservation of biodiversity, carbon storage, and participation in nutrient cycles. But we're going to go into detail now. But the, the question here is this irrelevance, but at what cost? We know there are certain externalities, negative, unwanted externalities that have to do, for example, with deforestation. So in this sense, we must recall uh, a study by the World Resources Institute carried out in 2019, uh, covering the 15 previous years, showed that only seven commodities were mainly responsible for almost a quarter of all deforestation. And of those seven commodities, most was precisely cattle. Notice the figures uh, here on the right side. Unfortunately, it continues, livestock or cattle continues to be one of the major ingredients of deforestation. It uh, produces uh, greenhouse gas emissions, 7.1 gigatons. That is, it means that 14.5% of human induced greenhouse gas emissions are covered by this. We see also intensification of livestock, uh, the nitrogen uh, overload, unpleasant odors, manure, wastewater, uh, undesired uh, scent uh, due to uh, the manure and uh, untreated wastewater. And as, I, as Lloyd was saying in his opening message just a moment ago, there's a great concern regarding animal welfare. No, if, if, at least at the uh, Alliance Biodiversity Seat, we believe we can, we can work towards a more sustainable livestock farming. And we will talk about the contributions that we provide. 
in a nutshell, we are an alliance that brings together the CGR centers. This is the largest network in the world, bringing together hundreds of research centers. It was created more than 50 years ago. And as one of the two, one of the two centers is SIAT created in Cali, Colombia 55 years ago. And we focus on research applied basically to create, to build capacities in the countries we work in and provide solutions and to help govern governments and universities and academia and public and private sectors and other communities to have find better solutions. And this is, a, as we call it, an alliance for accelerated change to bring solutions at the nexus of agriculture, environment and nutrition. On the other hand, we believe that now more than ever, and COVID uh, helped us highlight this, but the successive crises and uh, the interrupted value chains now and the lack of grains re as a result of the war in, the U in Ukraine has reminded us that without science and technology, we cannot face the challenges we have in uh, livestock and agriculture. And uh, these should uh, science and, and technology should help us improve production in an efficient manner to help promote a more sustainable, resilient, nutritious, and inclusive food systems uh, through research and innovation, providing obviously science-based information for better decision-making and action, and contributing also uh, with investments to produce impacts, reduce impacts, and to facilitate post-COVID post re recovery. So we see all the, the linkages here. Of these 55 years, we have been focusing most of our time on uh, livestock because at SEAT, uh, the, the Alliance uh, by uh, the Alliance of Diverse Diversity, we have been working on a germplasm bank that was recently renovated, the largest collection of tropical grasslands. And a good part of that has been aimed at managing the uh, the grasslands improving uh, the management and even improving the pastures in order to uh, thus uh, reduce the required inputs and nutrients and fertilizers and other types of inputs and also to improve animal health and productivity obviously as well as uh, well welfare and we must see climate uh, the reduction of environmental impacts via carbon sequestration for example and this image here to the left shows all the connection between uh, all the different uh, uh, systems uh, which is uh, which are so complex but we want to have sustainable intensification as we call it so that that livestock and cattle in general has a lesser environmental footprint. In this next slide, uh, 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 talking about the principles uh, and how we can contribute to sustainable food systems, this is not only based on uh, pastures, but through better practices also uh, enhancing uh, diversity, nutrient flow, productivity, uh, in the thinking of internal and external nitrogen sources, including in forages and legumes, diversification and mixing species. And we devote most time in uh, research on the internal and external nitrogen sources, as I just said, the inclusion of uh, foraging legumes that are the most appropriate, for example, that reduce uh, the amount of methane and other gas house, uh, uh, gases emitted, uh, looking for uh, optimal civil pastoral systems 
and uh, seeking the optimal ha grass height for cattle consumption so that they use up less energy and but take advantage of this better. On the right hand side, we can see the car carbon accumulation in biomass. The, we see the forests and the natural corridors and the reduced methane em emissions improving better, uh, improving cattle nutrition and all of this not only happens above soil, but also within the soil for better soil health. As to forage, we have been investigating and doing research for more than 45 years, and our objective is to identify and produce a, 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 a forage species adapted to the uh, biotic and abiotic stresses and contribute to increase animal productivity while at the same time reducing environmental impacts as well as reducing the areas required to respond to livestock demand and obviously reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. The impacts to date as a program uh, more specifically with forage, we see the apomictic uh, hybrids that are readily available to the market. We, uh, as an international research center, we seek to improve uh, practices and systems, and we have more than more than one million hectares uh, planted with those uh, seed hybrids. Uh, so in 75 countries, this is a huge impact at the same time. Not only have we gone to these hybrids, but we do research to find the most optimal ones. And we have also at the same time created sustainable livestock uh, systems, Ganso Guarantee. This is a tool where through a voluntary contribution, we seek to link uh, uh, beef farms producing uh, under zero deforestation with sustainable practices in markets. Through research, we have seen that every dollar invested has generated almost two, what, two dollars just in the LAC region alone. And we have two powerful and open access online knowledge tools uh, for the whole world uh, re regarding uh, tropical for forage. In ending with the Ganso system, not only have we been doing uh, the, the research uh, on forage, we have been working with IPCC and other partners developing a more comprehensive view, a more system-wide view, seeking uh, sustainable livestock with the Ganso label. We have generated sufficient evidence uh, for uh, uh, and we are, are measuring to see how, how much more you uh, consumers are willing to pay, and we have entered into uh, organizations and with different guilds and ministries and the different countries, public sector, private sector. We have provided advice in the development of uh, labels, indicators, monitoring, and we have assisted in the dissemination of the label and its benefits. With Ganso in Colombia, we have 140 farms. There is 40,000 hectares of productive land and 11,000 hectares of conservation forests. We have uh, seven uh, Ganso endorsed farms. These are seven, but huge in fact, and they represent almost 10% of the forest and 25% of all the productive land. Uh, this uh, Ganso label is very well known already. It is not only a pilot project, it is already underway and we have ever more producers and farms that want to work with us. And with this, I end with some final remarks as uh, opening comments. The importance, obviously, of any type of effort uh, should be basically uh, based on science, because a, a good part of the results will come from science. Enhanced uh, seeds and pastures, what systems produce less methane, 
uh, in, in cows, et cetera. We also must support amongst us all the development of long-term strategies. We should, uh, and uh, we need to start now, but any solution that is uh, sought requires long-term, but because we need to convince, and that is the third point, we have to work at different scales, the, with the value chains, the food systems, uh, and all the uh, as, as seeking at all times public-private partnerships. We must work on the creation of wide and effective coalitions, particularly because we're talking about the longer term and we need to help create enabling environments in all the, for all this research coalitions and, and, and medium and long-term strategies. We're talking there about markets and sustainable financing that will help to exper experiment and uh, expand. We must work in the area of policies, social and human capital, obviously, and the multiple, cult the multi multiple cultural values. And in the end, uh, it, is, is it is not that uh, livestock is to blame. No, it is the way we are growing in a, a non-efficient manner. But I believe that we left uh, a COP26 in Glasgow in the sense that friends, politicians, cattle raisers, uh, ranchers, uh, it is very important for us to start as of now working on a solution. And I thank you very much. I would like to congratulate Ika and Mr. Levalle for bringing this subject matter to the table with the partners that have joined us today so that together without any feeling of guilt, we start instead to work together on the new generation of livestock that will be sustainable and um, much ad more adaptable with this I end. And I offer the floor back to the moderator. Thank you. Uh, please stay with me, Jesus. Uh, excellent presentation. I'm, uh, and you're right. And I saw the announcement uh, at the COP uh, on deforestation. I thought that was fantastic news. Um, and I had, I was just looking. It's not the cow. It's the how. I don't think I've seen that before. That's pretty cool too. Um, if you or Natalia can can add uh, links to Ganso or uh, links to your research in the chat, that would be great. And I noticed we have a question from Josefina. Um, can Gloria or Isabel give uh, Fosafina the, the, the floor, please? Fosafina? Okay, well, yeah. okay, yeah, there you are. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I was just wondering, I, my name is Josefina oh, Isabel, I work for the Global Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. What is your relation with the Ganso project with the National Roundtable? And yeah, because we at GRSP we have global metrics on on yeah on like on land use change on animal welfare. So it could be really good to kind of uh, work together with with the Ganso project to really start measuring and starting to report progress at what Colombia is doing on sustainable beef. So. What's the relation? That's my question with them. Bueno, no, gracias, gracias por la pregunta. Um, no, es una Thank you so much for the question. Ganso is a creation with different uh, organizations financing this. We're the promoter and the creator so that we can move a little bit forward. Uh, sometimes we have a prototype and in our field in Cali, so we decide to uh, put this into practice and in the creation of a structure that it's uh, managed by itself, but that it is supported by uh, CIET with external financing. But the idea is that this is uh, a bit more like sustainable by itself. But of course, we would like that offer of uh, contribution as and as, the, uh, as Mr. Lavalle was saying, I'm going to put the link to Ganso. It is only in Spanish, unfortunately, but we could provide some documents and some papers if you, if you want to, if you want to ask us about our experience and how we can share this with you. 
So we can, as, as we finish this, I'm gonna put in the chat a link so that you can know a little bit more about this. In the chat too, there's some questions about the presentation. Um, just uh, for the audience and the public, if we are posting all the videos from all the webinar series on our ECA Canada webpage. So you'll be able to follow the entire series there and, and see the different slides from the presentations. And maybe Isabel and Gloria can add a link in the chat to our ECA Canada webpage. My thanks, Jesus. I had questions too, but I'd like to move on because we have a really, really interesting panel. We've got four speakers. We have Canadian perspectives, Argentina, Uruguay, Brazil. So lots to cover still. Um, my next guest will be Christine Tapley. And she's from Ducks Unlimited Canada. She's the sustainable lead there. And um, over to you, I'm Christine, please. Hi, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Thanks for having me. Uh, home, oops, I see that I'm at the end of my I'm sorry, um, you might have to just carry back with me. You'll see what we're gonna look at. Um, but anyway, uh, thank you for, for uh, um, letting me join in today. Hopefully my voice holds out. You'll see that it, it's pretty small today, but um, so speaking about livestock's role in a high value food, food system, I'm a beef producer myself um, here in Manitoba, Canada. Uh, but I also am a director at the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. Um, and I work for a conservation organization called Ducks Unlimited Canada. So lots of, uh, lots of ways to tie into this conversation. Um, and I'll focus probably mostly on, on land conversion today. Um, so a little bit about who Ducks Unlimited Canada is. We're if you national... can share your screen, Christine, please. Oh, you can't see. Okay. We're looking at you. You're looking at and me. your beautiful smile. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's no good. Um, okay, let me try again. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, guys. Fantastic. Can you see now? Yes, perfect. Thanks so much. Okay. I think uh, Gloria is sharing the presentation, so please just let her know when you need to. Okay. Pass this. Talk. Sorry about this. Okay. So I'm on the second uh, slide. Wonderful. Okay. Um, so. Tax Unlimited Canada is a national uh, habitat conservation organization uh, interested in preserving and restoring natural areas. And so they started back in 1938 during a historical uh, drought and to help farmers put water back on the land. And so ever since we've been doing farm gate programming um, such that we're really deeply rooted in, in working with agriculture, um, as an environmental organization. And, and I think that this is one of our greatest strengths really is that strong partnership between conservation and agriculture um, and understanding why that's an important uh, collaboration. But I think also understanding the immense pressure that is being put on farmers to deliver more and more, um, but still deliver the ecological goods and services and not necessarily be compensated for it. So next slide, Gloria, please. Um, and so why is a conservation organization like Ducks Unlimited Canada uh, working with agriculture and specifically the beef industry? Well, certainly because they, they manage all the habitat. Um, we think about biodiversity specifically, uh, land use for beef cattle in Canada production represents 33% of the ag landscape but 68% of the wildlife habitat capacity uh, in that agricultural landscape. So uh, certainly punching above their weight in terms of what they can provide uh, to habitat and wildlife. Um, can Canada's grasslands provide uh, over a home to over 60 species at risk. 
And we've definitely seen the impacts of habitat loss as we lose grasslands. Um, we are, our, our grassland bird populations have dramatically declined in the last uh, 40 years or so, but the, the remaining habitat is largely owned by private landowners uh, in agriculture. So we need to find ways to work with them. Uh, and then carbon, I know, has been mentioned already today uh, because it's always mentioned. <laughs> carbon is such a, um, an important topic these days. Uh, and Canada Parks and Wilderness Society estimates that 2.3, or sorry, 2 to 3 billion tons of carbon per hectare lies in the first meter of uncultivated grasslands. And if we are to cultivate those grasslands, we, we lose so much carbon. So it's very important that we keep them intact if we want to meet these goals. Um, and then water, I think, is another really important one to raise. So in Canada, we have about 52 million acres of grassland. But in embedded in those grasslands, we have 1.6 million acres of wetlands. And wetlands are those biodiversity hotspots, and they bring life to the re rest of the areas around it. And, and they're so important and are far less at risk if they are embedded in grasslands versus croplands. Um, and I think this really highlights the need for proactive policy um, and finding ways to work with private landowners to protect the habitat that is, that is remaining. Uh, next slide, please. So, <clears throat> I've talked about um, the benefits of the beef industry a little bit uh, as a connection to, to the landscape that they occupy, but I think it's twofold. So first being that in Canada, we have our native landscape, uh, or a lot of our native landscape is, is prairie and grasslands. And um, that ecosystem was developed with a large grazer and um, that is how it evolved. And so with the bison, uh, you know, uh, grazing on the, on that ecosystem, and so to remove a large grazer, to not have cattle grazing, um, that ecosystem wouldn't be wouldn't thrive because we really do need that interaction. But then, second, a well managed um, well managed cattle use the grassland ecosystem as it exists. I think we're so fortunate in Canada for beef production because. Um, we don't need to alter the native ecosystem in order to have a thriving um, cattle industry. Uh, it just needs to stay as it is. <laughs> and by keeping cattle on the landscape, you actually can keep those grasslands and those native ecosystems intact. Um, and we have seen, unfortunately, that as you lose beef producers uh, because of the economics, uh, then we also lose grasslands and wetlands as well. And it's in conservation's best interest then to find ways to support the beef industry to keep them on the landscape for uh, to, to keep habitat intact. Next slide, please. So um, in today's context, um, Canada holds 25% of the world's remaining wetlands. So something that we can be very proud of. This is a picture of, of wetlands, the dark areas are water, and of course the lighter green areas are pasture lands. So it really shows you my comment about there is so much water embedded in the grasslands, and and the the wetlands are protected when they're being when they are embedded in those grasslands. And and yeah, I think you can really see and get a feel for that here. Um, but we are losing both grasslands and wetlands. We only have twenty four percent of our grasslands remaining, and twenty percent of our wetlands remaining, and the ones that still are on the landscape are, are largely privately owned, uh, as I keep saying. Um, and so Dex Unlimited Canada uh, are really good at offering farm gate programming, but that's an acre by acre solution, knocking on one door at a time. And we don't think that this is going to be enough. We need landscape change and supporting the beef industry as a whole to keep cattle and ranches on the landscape um, has the same outcome, but hopefully at a greater scale. So, um, so we think that we need to maybe change our tact a little bit and, and start supporting the industry as a whole. Next slide, please. So I've, I've kind of been alluding to this, but I think we should just call out the challenge that's before us. And, and I know that this is not unique to Canada by any stretch, but the global demand for agriculture products, of course, is growing. Um, but there, and therefore there are many, many pressures 
uh, to convert natural habitats to cultivation to grow crops. And relatively, or certainly in Canada, relatively few policies and incentives um, that recognize the value of grassland systems and keeping them intact. Next slide. Um, so why do grasslands get broken in Canada? So this, this um, uh, picture is a, the plow print map. I'm sure many of you know it from WWF and, and the orange is um, areas that have been cultivated from grasslands and the green is areas that are still intact. And I've tried to draw in the, the black line where uh, the border between Canada and the US. Um, and so certainly in Canada, when we were being settled, it was a condition that you needed to break prairie in, and grow crops as kind of an economic development. So that was, a, you know, off, off to a good start as far as maintaining grassland. Um, but since then, market pressures certainly are a major driver, uh, as I'm sure are everywhere. Um, the bottom line is that you can make more dollars per acre by growing soybeans than you can by growing beef. And so um, these folks are having to make those decisions. And, and I think that another really big factor, at least in Canada, is the business risk management or the insurance programs that we have are much stronger on the crop side and um, maybe hold up some of those decisions um, to farm, to crop farm marginal areas and, and don't necessarily, um, again, value the, what the other benefits are that the livestock sector brings. Next slide, please. So I wanna focus a little bit more on how grasslands are part of a high value food system. And so I, I think that until we begin to recognize or, or even monetize those other products that we talked about that come from a grass-based system like biodiversity, carbon storage, water, um, the economics are going to continue to drive conversion. And so of course we need to support tools and programs and policies for our farmers and ranchers, but it's not crops versus beef. And I always try and make sure I say that um, because 60% of the beef farmers in Canada are also crop growers. And so it, it's not um, one industry or the other. It's uh, one person owns this much land or manages this much land and, and those markets will drive them to cultivate more or less of, that, of their land base to stay in business. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, obviously we know from, from this discussion that beef production and the landscape that it happens on offers lots of lots and lots of benefits. Um, but having beef part of the larger agricultural system uh, has even greater value. So in Canada, more than 80% of cattle, uh, what they eat in their lifetime is forage base. And nearly one third of all agricultural land in Canada is pasture, much of which can't be suited to uh, crop production. And so beef cattle are bringing value to these lands that can't grow crop, can't or shouldn't grow crops. And then when you think about um, what the, the marvelous rumen can do, um, cattle can also make use of crops that are not suitable for human consumption, um, both off-grade uh, crops, but also byproducts from processing. And so if we were to remove livestock from the system, we would have devastating effects on biodiversity and carbon loss and water holding capacity, as I've mentioned, but there would also be a lot of waste from crops that can no longer be used by cattle and would essentially um, you know, end up as, as garbage. Um, so I think we need to continue to find ways, um, solutions so that we can, we're, we're more sustainable when we, when we work together. Uh, next slide, please. I just wanted to give a couple of uh, quick examples of where I think we're trying to move uh, to support support the industry and, and, and find new ways uh, to support livestock on the landscape. Um, so at Dax Unlimited Canada, as I mentioned, we're, we're very good at the farm gate programming and working directly with landowners. Um, but recently we've been trying to engage the rest of the value chain so that we can engage that supply chain and again, have a larger scale landscape impact. 
Um, and so one example of that is working with McDonald's Canada and Cargill through their Beef Up program. They support a forage program through ducks. Uh, and the goal is to um, turn 125,000 acres of annual cropland into perennial forage. And so again, putting that perennial cover back on, on uh, the landscape. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this is a slide that gives a couple examples of tree goals are. Um, so they have through their national beef strategy, you can go to uh, Canadian, oh sorry, beefstrategy.com where it lists many more goals than this. Um, but here are some, some pretty uh, uh, robust and, and um, big goals that they have set for themselves for 2030. Uh, one being that to sequester an additional 3.4 million tons of carbon per year um, and to maintain all of the native grassland that they currently have. So um, they're, they're doing some more really wonderful things uh, within the Canadian beef industry. And then next slide. And then I think I would I'd really like to highlight the, I, I think we've learned that we have the greatest impact when conservation and, and the livestock sector work together and find ways to, um, to support each other. So we have uh, recently put in a joint submission to Canada's next ag policy framework. Uh, again, when conservation or the environmental side and agriculture can come together and agree on what the next agricultural policy framework should work it should look like, I think that's a major success. And finally, uh, the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Beef, who I know you have heard from before, but um, another great example of landscape scale um, impact where 17% of our Canadian beef herd is now, um, is, is now through that program. So, so really, really phenomenal success uh, through that mm -hmm. program. And thank you, that's it. Well, thank you. Uh, great final message on the conservation and examples from the certification at CRSB in Canada. It's definitely there's demand for that. It's peaking right now. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation and I was looking at the images of uh, the prairies in Alberta where I, I grew up uh, and uh, the mountains it reminded me of home. But I, uh, we don't, what I'm going to do is invite you to share some of your links for Ducks Limited, uh, CRSB, any numbers, stats, research, that you feel is valuable for the group, please post them in the chat. And uh, we're gonna go from Canada to Argentina from one end of the, of the hemisphere to another and invite uh, Pablo Pagliasco uh, from uh, Vida Silvestre to uh, share his thoughts. Over to you, Pablo. Sí, hola. Eh. Hello, yes. Allow me to try to upload my presentation. Can you see it now? Yes, perfect. Yes, sir. Okay, today we will be talking about how uh, livestock preserves high value food systems. I am the other end of the Americas. So we have gone from Canada to Argentina, but I will talk very similar to what uh, uh, Christine has sent, uh, said, but related to Argentina to set the framework of our conversation as a planet. I will show you some images if, if I can. Okay, here we have the Living Planet Index and it shows that way back in the 1970s, basically when I was born, at the time of my birth, the biomass uh, at the time was huge as compared to what it remains today, which is only 6% of that. So throughout my lifetime, we lost so much biomass, wild biomass in Central and South America that there is only 6% remaining of what existed when I was born. And that happened in all continents, but even more noticeably in Central and South America. So, we will talk about how to match production and conservation because this loss of biodiversity 
due to tension basically occurs due to the loss of habitats, the conversion of ecosystems, natural ecosystems and to croplands. So let us look at the problems we come across in Argentina. And from what I see, these apply to the entire globe. And the solutions we have been finding through Fundación Vida Silvestre, an environmental NGO that works seeking uh, solutions for production. This is the map of Argentina with its fine, uh, the different ecoregions. Each color represents a different region with its own flora and fauna. Argentina, together with 100 other countries, signed the biological the convention on biological diversity and is has pledged to preserve at, le at least 17 percent of its territory and when we think about preservation of 17 percent it should not just be one one little bunch in one little re eco region no 17 percent of each eco region the thing is that if we look at some of the uh the most uh, livestock driven eco re uh, regions here. This is Chaco Seco, Chaco Humedo, Espinal, and Pampas. And here we have uh, other, another one. These are very much focused on livestock. If we see how much is left and uh, how much it, 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 it remains. Let us look at Pampas, for example. 1% is protected, but the aim is seven, at least 17%, and we have already con, uh, converted about 80%. So we want, if we want to preserve something that has almost disappeared. And the region of Espinal is going down the same region, uh, which is right now around Pampas. This is Pampas and in lighter green is Espinal. And this occurs in a context where 90% of the land in Argentina is in private hands. So we must preserve wildlife as well as, uh, but the land is private. So what is our view here? We have an ecoregion and all its wildlife where we see flora and fauna. And in this Pampa ecoregion, 80% of that life has disappeared. But there are uh, cattle raising systems, there are beef systems that coexist with all this biodiversity and others that do not. In our ecosystems, ecoregions, the same occurs. This is Chaco Humedo. All the lyo biodiversity has remained there together with cows, for example. And in Espinal, we see that 50% uh, no longer exist. Uh, so we're not, we're not only worried about cattle. In the case of El Chaco, this region here, this is the dry forest in El Chaco, a very forest-oriented ecoregion eco with important fauna but there are livestock systems that can preserve all of this while producing at the same time. That means that as opposed to what happens, for example, in jungle areas or more tropical areas where there is livestock and wildlife cannot be preserved in these ecosystems, uh, we can, we can develop livestock together with conservation, where wildlife cannot be preserved is in a landscape like this. So we have to think about this. We have to absorb this. We can look, we cannot even see wildlife here. What will we find? Pests, weeds, and a few species of flora and fauna that have been able to survive there. But that does not mean to say that is the biodiversity we need to preserve. No, that is the one that does not need help. The one we need to preserve is elsewhere. So here we see, let's see, let's see if I can work on this a minute, just, just a second. Well, in this map here in green, we see the areas that are still natural and in yellow, 
areas that have been converted due to changes in land use where there were savannas, grasslands and forests. Now there are crops like the ones we just saw in the previous photograph. The uh, Pampa ecoregion to the right, we see where the majority has been lost and what we see here in green a lot of that has been substituted by perennial crops and pastures that are very difficult to differentiate uh, through a satellite image like this, what is, what is natural and what is cultivated. So wildlife has been limited to areas that have not been converted, this part in green here and in the green part the non-converted part, it, it, it does not mean there is no uh, livestock there because there is. So a rapid conclusion is that we need to lead ecosystem conversion to a minimum, both deforestation as well as replacing grasslands for croplands. We need to stop that. Wildlife is restricted to the same uh, areas as uh, as the the cows, for example, uh, this is the cattle activity that could advance in very natural systems, and cattle raisers are custodians of the remaining wildlife. Know it or not, there are still threats because these livestock systems that we see and that are compatible with wildlife, select the mistaken technologies, well, mistaken in the sense of conservation, like re replacing with uh, forage crops, for example, or even a forestry uh, re to replace uh, pasture uh, grasslands. And we see at the same time degradation because of the poor use of uh, grazing lands. But in these humid areas, this is very easy to correct. So degradation is, is not as serious a problem as is conversion up above. That is an irreversible problem. At Fundación Vida Silvestre, for many years now, we have been working on aiming at biodiversity conservation compatible livestock. So what we did was out of all the uh, technologies available for uh, uh, livestock, we wanted to see which were most friendly to conservation. It is interesting to see which are conservation friendly and which are not, and then uh, test them in demonstration uh, plantations through sustainable management. Some of these uh, demonstration fields basically became wildlife reserves, private wildlife reserves, because they did uh, so well. And they have a combination here of wildlife and cattle, as we can see in the photograph. There is training provided for producers, for uh, students, and a lot of research continues to improve the adjustment between flora, fauna, and livestock. All these technologies identified as more conservation and, uh, friendly, we have made available through these uh, didactic materials that can be downloaded from this uh, link you can see here. For the Chaco region, we also have conservation friendly technologies that are available at this other link. And I will dwell on this just a moment because there may be people from Colombia with us or that work on more silvopastoral systems. The silvopastoral system that we can see here at the link is based on native forest, native vegetation. I believe that silvopastoral system, the most perfect system I have ever seen is this one. Why? Because it is using native plants, native trees, it produces timber. And when they uh, cut the timber, they plant future trees. So there is always uh, a, 
ba basically there there continues to be a chain a chain uh with re reproduction of all the uh elements in the area and this does not occur in artificial cultivated areas the outcome of all this work has shown that there has been a car carbon capture in soil here, which is greater than emissions generated by the production systems, including uh, methane from uh, cattle. So we can have carbon neutral systems in uh, our livestock systems. Efficiency in fossil fuel usage, this is almost endless because uh, there is very little fossil energy used because it is more based on natural uh, systems. And the economic uh, benefits in the long term are the best. I will show you a comparison here. Uh, the two columns in green are best practices that are very compatible with uh, wildlife conservation. And these are compared to very intensive or semi-intensive systems that produce more by replacing uh, grasslands and with more old intensive systems that did not replace the grasslands but manage the pasture very poorly. But what is worth highlighting here is that in the recommended practices to preserve wildlife, there is only a replacement of only up to 5% of natural uh, grasslands. The, it is mostly natural pasture land. Beef production is around 200 kilos, where in the most intensive systems, they produce twice as much with uh, forage crops. But the financial result here, the economic result in the long term, averaging years when the business has been better or in years where the business has been not as good, we can see the advantages over the long term, thanks to natural grassland systems as compared to the cultivated ones where there are years where they could be in fact lead to losses. And the more sub, uh, sustainable matters uh, sequester carbon instead of issuing. And the climate risk of these systems based on native vegetation that has evolved where it has always been is very low. When there is a drought or flooding, native vegetation is not lost, whereas the cultivated land does uh, get lost. So if we calculate the economic results considering climate risk, well then, uh, it, we would never reach the high values uh, as the most intensive systems. Now, as closing remarks then, yes, we can produce preserving biodiversity at the same time, but process technologies that are used, uh, that is knowing how to manage the pastures and grasslands appropriately is something not for sale. What is for sale are seeds and agrochemicals. Nobody promotes that. You turn the radio on and you hear promotions and all you hear is the sale of seeds or of agrochemicals. No one is selling us the idea of knowledge and how to better manage grasslands. And that is where we need to intervene. As a development policy, these uh, production models without conversion improve the business and bring stability and less risk in face of climate and prices. They preserve wildlife and traditions and they enroute everyone. They keep ecosystem services as infiltration, water purification. They reduce the speed of surface runoff. They regulate the depth of the water table. They contribute to the commitments to lower emissions and reach a uh, high percentage of protected areas by ecoregion. They recover in the natural image of Argentine and beef, and they prevent possible para, uh, para tariff barriers. And this is certifiable and separates production from the production provision of inputs. And this is compatible with uh, small and large producers and uh, the economic and uh, the, this produces economic and productive results that are very beneficial. Thank you very much.
gracias a usted, Pablo. Uh, hay manera de compartir en el chat los uh, enlaces a los reportes, modelos, resultados uh, de vida silvestre, por favor. Um, los... Excelente, muy bien. Um, para mí, hay que pensar más en las soluciones, incentivos, capacitación. Well, we should think of training. If you have any uh, resources on training, incentives, solutions, uh, policy guidance, uh, anything that you find worthy to share in the chat, please, um, happy to uh, promote it uh, here. I'm, we're going to go a bit north now. Uh, we're moving away from Argentina to Brazil. And we're, I'm going to invite uh, Pedro Amaral. He's the sustainable, uh, the senior sustainability manager at Mars Global Pet Care in Brazil. Over to you, Pedro. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Ika, for the invitation. Thanks for everyone who's joining us today. Let me start sharing my screen in a moment. Great. I hope we can all see it now. Uh, yeah, looks good. Okay, great. So my name is Pedro Amaral and I work in Mars, where I lead globally uh, work streams around beef and soy uh, sustainability. I'm going to be briefly touching on our uh, work around nuestro trabajo. beef. Oh, and I can hear myself. Someone is translating. It's getting back to me in Spanish. That's all good now. You can go ahead. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Um, so Mars does buy beef. Uh, Mars buys beef to make a great um, pet food. And I'm going to be briefly talking uh, about uh, our work, uh, mainly from an environmental perspective on our beef supply chains. Uh, Mars is a global uh, family owned business. Uh, we have presence in over 80 countries and we have over 130,000 associates. Uh, I work in Mars Pet Care. Um, where we produce some of uh, very well-known brands of pet food that you can see at the bottom uh, of the screen. And Mars has set a number of uh, public-facing sustainability commitments that are all under our Sustainable in a Generation Plan. I'm going to be focusing on the healthy planet pillar of the plan and, and focusing uh, on climate change and, and on, on deforestation, subjects that have been brought by some of the other panelists already. Um, so as you can see at the left side of the screen, we have made a commitment to go uh, to achieve net zero carbon emissions uh, by 2050. This is the glide path. It's, it's available in our public facing commitment. Um, and, and something that I would emphasize is that uh, almost 80% of our greenhouse gas emissions is estimated to be coming from um, the raw material that we buy. Not only beef, uh, but also a, a number of other raw materials that we buy that are somehow associated to land use change and that have uh, agricultural emissions uh, associated to them. Uh, so this makes up around 80% uh, of all Mars total business um, footprint back in 2015, which is our baseline. At the right side of the screen, you can see also uh, another public facing commitment that was made by Mars uh, to decouple these specific raw materials that we buy from, from deforestation by 2025. And, and there is, a, again, a, a direct relationship between decoupling that from deforestation and, and reducing our uh, supply chain uh, emissions and achieving our uh, net zero emission uh, target. How we do it? We rely on data, we rely on science. Uh, our approach is to map, manage, and monitor our supply chains. Uh, we are further away from, from ranches. We're further away from, from the farms. Uh, beef, we usually buy from rendering companies that in turn buy from uh, meat packers, uh, who are the ones buying uh, from, from ranchers. So we, we have to do a lot of traceability work to achieve uh, the granularity that will then allow us to have insights as to potential policy breaches, including uh, deforestation. Um, with that information, we then engage with our suppliers and, and try to build on the work that they are 
are doing already to monitor where they buy from and, and how that uh, is or not associated to deforestation. And in a number of cases, our suppliers have already commitments themselves and have been using technology uh, to monitor uh, the farms that they buy from. Um, all this to say that, that technology exists and, and whenever a supplier is not adopting that, we also partner with other organizations to help deploy capacity building activities and to support them in, in adopting these um, um, systems. In this process, we, we partner with uh, a number of uh, local and international organizations. I can name a few uh, NGOs that we are partnering with, uh, including uh, ProForest, Ima Flora, and National Wildlife Federation. Uh, it's a very complex subject, so we rely on, on experts, on local experts, to be able to connect our global uh, ambitions with the best practices uh, being adopted uh, on the ground. Now, beyond deforestation, uh, and, and some of the for, uh, former panelists uh, already touched on this, uh, science is clear that there is a set of technologies already available uh, in the cattle sector that can help us uh, intensify production, have farmers uh, uh, you know, uh, be more productive and reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, on the left side of the screen, you can see uh, a picture and, uh, and just a snapshot of, uh, of research published by FAPESPE in Brazil, in which they came up with a conclusion that integrating livestock with crops and with forestry in some specific farms actually resulted in, in, in average emission, uh, actually below half of the global average uh, for beef. There is also uh, research showing the different uh, impact in terms of uh, uh, systems cattle uh, rearing systems uh, and from degraded pasture land to managed pasture land to again integrated uh, crops livestock and forestry systems which in the end of the day uh, this the research on the on the on the right side actually shows a carbon negative beef um, uh, in a 10-year period Moving to a, a, a bit north, uh, there is also a number of technologies that can be adopted to uh, reduce, um, to better manage manure and, and reduce methane emissions coming out of manure and actually help farmers uh, uh, benefit from that, uh, including helping better conservation of the agricultural land by having good fertilizer that they can apply at the land, uh, diversified farm revenue, uh, and a number of other um, uh, benefits uh, that the US EPA uh, really nicely uh, uh, outlines on, on the year uh, Ag Star program. On the right side of the screen, another example, this is from Argentina, in which again, intensifying production helps uh, reduce uh, the intensity of the beef uh, produced. All this to say, if we circle back to Mars uh, net zero commitments, Part of the work is about ensuring that we decouple the beef that we buy from deforestation, so we reduce um, land use change emissions. And part of the work is about ensuring that we help deploy these technologies that will help farmers, that will help ranchers reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions at, at the ranch level. So we are working on both uh, avenues to ensure uh, we reduce emissions of our supply chain building again on, on best practices that are adopted already uh, by ranchers, uh, but that can be scaled up, that can be adopted by a, a wider uh, number of, of ranchers in our, in our supply chain. We also acknowledge that these are huge challenges and, and that we need to work collaboratively with other uh, companies with peer companies um, to be able to accelerate the implementation of, of these sort of commitments. This is one of the reasons why we are part of the CGF uh, Forest Positive Coalition of Action, in which we are working collaboratively with 20 other large downstream companies to help uh, align on our expectations 
from ourselves and from our suppliers to help align on how we transparently report on progress in implementing our own commitments and to align on how we all contribute for this uh, ambition to become a reality by making investments in, in at scale uh, approaches that will help um, farmers, ranchers um, adopt uh, good farming practices that will, in the end of the day, um, help them be more productive, reduce pressure over expansion uh, on native vegetation, uh, be more productive and, and reduce uh, emissions. And in, in the end of the day, uh, I would summarize just by emphasizing um, Mars work and all these, we, we have very bold and clear uh, commitments that are all under the umbrella of our sustainable in a generation plan. I believe that agriculture is part of the solution. We need to work with, uh, with farmers so, so we can meet our uh, goals. We need to work with uh, our suppliers, uh, the supply chain actors all the way to the farm level to be able to achieve our uh, global ambitions. Uh, and this is something that we're gonna be doing. We're gonna keep on doing. We're gonna keep on working with suppliers, with external, with other partners and with peers uh, to ensure that, again, our suppliers thrive, to ensure that we meet our global ambitions. And, and again, building on something that someone said before, uh, also to ensure that the beef sector is also uh, a clear part of the solution uh, for the climate crisis and for a number of other uh, global uh, challenges that, that we all face. So, so again, I, I appreciate and I thank you for the invitation. I'm happy to, to answer any, any questions or uh, make any comments uh, regarding the work that we're doing. Great perspective, Pedro, from Brazil. I've been enjoying uh, all the presentations uh, my, my, with my PhD in geography. I've, I've noticed everyone's been using maps, which is fantastic. Um, you do have a question in the chat uh, from Igor. Um, it's a supply chain issue, how to manage tier two suppliers in the beef chain. Is that something you can answer? Yes, I can try answering that. Um, tier two suppliers from our perspective or from the perspective of the meatpacker? Not clear from the question. Okay, well, from our perspective, we engage with our tier one suppliers, which are usually renderers, and we, we go with them, then engage with the meatpackers who, who are supplying them. So it's about uh, um, a supplier engagement process. Now, with regards to uh, the tier two suppliers of, of the meatpackers, traceability is, is a key challenge. We, we are well aware of the indirect supplier uh, uh, you know, challenge in countries like Brazil. So this is why uh, we are also partnering with organizations like uh, NWF uh, to deploy tools that will help uh, meatpackers monitor indirect cattle suppliers, including uh, VZPAC. So we are also uh, trying to find the best solutions and, and help uh, deploy them and help uh, scale mm -hmm. up their adoption. I'm going to invite you actually to continue chatting with Igor. Uh, he has a follow-up question. And I'm going to invite Santiago from Uruguay uh, to uh, pr provide his presentation, but you can continue uh, your responses and chatting with Igor. Um, so Santiago Farina is part of INIA in Uruguay. It's the National Institute for Agriculture Research. And although he's part of the milk production program, uh, he'll be also speaking to uh, foragers and pastures. Over to you, Santiago. Thank you, Sean Charles. A pleasure to be here um, sharing some thoughts on the innovation of um, on pasture management in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, we're talking, we talk about, um, I grew up on a beef farm, um, but I've been working on dairy for many years. So happy to talk about this, what you see in the background picture, which is um, a farm system in Costa Rica. Uh, and this is how we produce uh, beef and dairy and milk in farming systems, uh, pasture-based farm systems in Latin America. Uh, we have cows, grazing all year round outdoors. We do it on permanent pastures, perennial pastures where uh, you're capturing carbon and recycling uh, nutrients from the cows. 
and, and within these environments where you can also share the habitat of, the, um, of other species like birds, you see there are trees uh, with cows. So um, in, with this perspective, we, we wonder, well, what's, you will be wondering what's the importance of um, these uh, farming systems in the global food system. Um, and we've been talking a lot about beef systems uh, so far. Um, so to have a bit of context on, on the dairy side, um, there is Latin America and Caribbean, it's uh, about 11% of the milk produced globally. So it's not that much, but the 13 countries that produce milk here um, have shown to be able to grow production in the last 20 years, um, actually a little bit more than uh, even the United States where, where they have most of the confined systems. Um, and this has been achieved also with most of the many countries and uh, not reducing the, the numbers of, of farmers, um, the number of farmers. So um, in saying that, uh, we wonder what's, um, how we can be sustainable with these farming systems and understand uh, better the business. So the business in terms of um, uh, ecologically, the business is actually to convert energy from the sun, water, and nutrients um, into biomass uh, in forage which is unedible um, by, by humans or people, and to use that efficiently, that biomass, to produce actually edible um, uh, food for humans, in this case with beef and, and dairy. But um, the, this sounds like a simple um, uh, look, uh, way of looking at the business, but actually many questions of how sustainable uh, these, these systems can be. And to discuss that, we, had to, we have been working in a, in a large project with many countries, and we started trying to understand uh, how do we, how do we um, analyze and evaluate a production systems in, in all the region. So in this case, in these pictures, you see a dairy and beef farm in Dominican Republic looked at by um, a researcher from Venezuela, one well, from a local, a guy from Panama, a guy from Costa Rica, and a guy from Chile. We all see a different reality, and we evaluate it differently. Um, so we had to come up with key performance indicators in this project of 11 countries to try to understand um, how are the systems now, and uh, how can they evolve sustainably. So we looked at um, both biophysical, economical, social, and environmental um, key PIs to understand how these systems can evolve. And one of the key outcomes of that project was that uh, these, uh, in, in these uh, steps that I had described before, the bottleneck or the limitation for these, these um, uh, the foods, the farming systems, uh, to be um, economically sustainable and self-sufficient was actually um, the conversion of the capture, the capturing of that biomass of forage uh, and convert it into, into beef and dairy. And we, in a global perspective, we realized from that analysis that it was actually compared to um, many of the so to say competitors or countries that actually also produce uh, food, um, particularly well, milk or beef from pasture, such as uh, countries in, in Oceania or countries in the United Kingdom, um, Europe or the United States. Um, in, in the region, and this example is Uruguay and Argentina, um, we were consuming uh, about half uh, as much forage as uh, the other countries which were actually um, achieving uh, about 10 tons of, of forage consumption per hectare per year. And in saying that, the interesting part was that uh, farm system research experiences were showing that there was potential with the same species and similar inputs to achieve double that uh, level of, of forage consumption uh, that farmers were achieving um, in the same environment and be able to be more self-sufficient uh, in that way. So um, in saying that, we are realized that the, the limiting factor was being the management, as Pablo was saying before, a process technology 
not an input technology that farmers hadn't didn't have to pay. No one is, was selling to them. So the, in, in focusing on the management, we 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 actually came back uh, to decision support systems, uh, a set of rules that could make farmers be more efficient in the way they use the pastures. And this was a development by Enia, just uh, based on other countries, also experiences of how to manage grazing in, in grasslands. Um, it was basically uh, following three steps, uh, recording the bias mass of fortnightly or weekly of all paddocks, then adjusting how much, adjusting rotation length, which is actually how, how, um, uh, how fast do you, you um, go back to a paddock? So how much pasture do you give each, to each cow each day? Um, so how, how much space do you give to them? And also controlling residuals, which is actually how intense each grazing could be. Uh, and this also actually, is actually available in, in uh, some uh, uh, communication materials. So that, that was the, something was was proved uh, experimentally, but we want, we had the challenge to scale it up uh, to farmers. So we went from um, on-farm experiences uh, such as this one with um, uh, young people being trained on, on these technologies uh, and side by side with farmers. And for instance, in these initial uh, pilot experiences, we achieved just with changing the management system 30% more pasture harvest per year, uh, higher stocking rate. It was a farmer that had a very low stocking rate, but without having to reduce meat production. So actually capturing um, a more profit for that for those farmers and actually giving them a, a, a new tools for for their um, for their, their self sufficiency. So the challenge ahead we 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 are we are having now in a new project is. Uh, to scale this up in the region, actually um, starting from Costa Rica and Argentina, uh, from Uruguay to Costa Rica and Argentina. But in doing that, we realized we couldn't do a linear traditional way of uh, communicating of, or transferring, transferring technology. And as this um, New Zealand research shows, in, it, there's many factors at play when we want to uh, change practices on farm, and, and especially when you involve technologies, and that is how what what awareness of the value of that technology the farmer have, uh, what practices have to be adapted, what tools uh, we um, if you actually we're trying to solve a problem the farmer doesn't have, how to use the data and so on. So we had to have a different approach, and so the approach we we chose here was a user experience design approach uh, to um, uh, incorporate these new tools. So in the three countries, we, we started working with groups of farmers selected by the, the farmers that had to be uh, committed and, and proactive, uh, but they actually needed uh, to improve their self-sufficiency and their, their um, uh, pasture consumption. And uh, all of them, uh, had one they actually now sharing the decision support system uh, for for a whole year and they interact uh, continuously with the developers of this decision support system to actually make that user experience uh, design and um, um, arrive at the end of the project to a very actually usable um, tool so this is the, the, the project that it's, it's going on now. It's about half a million dollar project. It's, it was three years. And the objective is um, this information we can share. And the, the objective is to increase self-sufficiency and sustainability by increasing um, the annual harvest of, 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 of farms. Uh, we call it annual harvest by, we talk about grace and conserve in the three countries by 30%. And um, in parallel, and we won't talk much about that today, but we are testing um, devices to rapid record of uh, pasture biomass uh, remotely. This is uh, actually a project funded by the Ministry of Primary Industries of um, New Zealand and the Global Research Alliance and executed by the, the research institutes of, of Uruguay, Costa Rica, and Argentina. 
so what is this about what's the tool about is is actually very simple uh, now it's in a web page there will be an application we record the biomass of each paddock um, um, on on farm and from that we you the the, the farmer or the technician that is growing the, that's uh, running this can um, access the, the key uh, indicators to make decisions which are this the stock the average stock um, the pasture wedge and the growth rates so this is what's happening uh, in it's actually um, replicated now and is, is going on um, in, in a parallel way in Costa Rica and Argentina and in Uruguay these actually pictures from Uruguay uh, the technicians recording uh, this is the, the two uh, guys from the farm and, and, a, and a, a guy that is helping out uh, taking records on the paddocks and the the young people involved in this project have actually developed um, a display where so farmers can see themselves within a map this is actually the map of Uruguay and uh, and they can access to their data of, of growth rates sorry this in Spanish growth rate uh, average stock and average residuals and to see how they are evolving um, in real time and compare themselves to the other farmers and they also can access reports of this on on whatsapp so the highlights so far uh, well, actually the farmers highlight from from these experiences they can see the impacts of um, a spring harvest from being more accurate on decision making of, of grazing and harvest. They are more reliant. They are more reliant on the, um, uh, on this fixed time decision making process, which fortnightly they they have to decide on data, and not just on their um, guess or expectations. They are actually more aware of uh, the feed reserves as a buffer for the systems. And we've seen uh, already interest in neighbor farmers and uh, the effects of those um, testimonies on the on on the uh, the rest of the the farmers in in this actually at, at least in two regions for where we are working, and they're actually demanding the continuation post project and how this is gonna um, scale up in time. So it's to be continuous, but still is we actually having less than a year of of on-farm advance of this project. So just to end, um, from to, to end up with what, we, what it started, um, this is actually what we see um, as sustainable for, for farming systems in beef and milk, um, because uh, particularly because um, economically uh, is clearly the lowest production cost in uh, feed, the grass grass is actually um, in an environment that can maintain most of the conditions of the native landscape, the grasslands, and socially is increasingly uh, the, what the citizens or consumers uh, want to see cows grazing outdoors. So happy to, to discuss or have any, any questions. Thank you all. On the contrary, thank you, Santiago. I thought I found the the results uh, very promising in terms of uh, preliminary findings, and I'm I'm really I wish you much continued success, and, and and I'm looking forward to seeing how the the results and the the modeling continues. Um, in terms of good practices, agriculture practices, incentives to inspire uh, change, and uh, we're out of time. We don't have time really Santiago for many questions, but I want to invite you to use the one minute or two that we have left to add anything to the chat in terms of uh, links to your research that you wanna share with the audience. Um, from my end, I want to thank all the panelists, uh, all the four panelists we, uh, and Jesus in terms of his opening remarks. Um, I've enjoyed this tremendously. A uh, reminder to the audience that this is the third of a series of five webinars. We have another webinar May 12th, that's the fourth webinar. We'll be looking at economics, profitability, markets. Um, you know, the economics of sustainability. Is it worthwhile? And so it, the last one will be June 1st. Uh, I'd like to thank the interpreters. Uh, no, it's not easy. We talk fast. <laughs> I know I do. Um, and uh, I want to thank again IFAD for their financial support, the logistics team, Arika, 
fantastic job, Gary, Isabel, and the team. Um, and to all of you, uh, the audience, thanks for taking part and taking time out of your uh, very busy schedules to be with us today. I hope you found the webinars of value and interest, and I look forward to seeing uh, everyone next week. Take good care, everyone. Cheers.